Hello. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come and, and talk um, about the Gilead pipeline, although I'm not going to talk about the pipeline. I'm only going to talk about BFTAF. So if you have questions about the capsid inhibitor or 9131, which have been alluded to during this conference, I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer those. Um, but they're not quite in phase two. So um, let's talk about BFTAF and treatment naive patients and treatment switch patients. So Bictegravir is a novel unboosted integrase strand transfer inhibitor. Um, it's formulated as a single tablet regimen with emtricitabine and tenofovir alafenamide, and it was recently approved by the US FDA for treatment of HIV infection in treatment naive and virologically suppressed adults without resistance to its components. Uh, this was based on mainly data from two phase three studies in naive participants, studies 1489 and 90, and two studies in virologically suppressed participants, studies 1844 and 1878. And through week 48, for these four studies, there was no development of resistance to the components of BFTAF. So what I'll share today uh, in, the out in the outline is uh, the in vitro resistance profile of BIC. Uh, very brief one slide on efficacy outcomes at week 48. And then we'll dive into um, what resistance we found at baseline pretreatment in these studies. Um, so that's where we're having our, our fun right now with virology. Um, and then we'll talk about a future clinical trials of BFTAF. Okay, so when we developed Bictegravir, we screened um, hundreds of molecules, and in that screening process, we did include integrase-resistant isolates. Um, so Bic has a favorable cross-resistance profile, and we engineered that in. So here I have actually site-directed mutations of all the primary, the single primary mutations you see in integrase. And the color coding here is based on the monogram assay. This is all monogram assay phenotypic data where white means sensitive and the cutoffs you can see at the bottom. Um, BIC is 2.5 in the assay versus 4.0 for DTG. Um, and then intermediate, if there's clinical cutoffs, um, there's an intermediate fold change of between 2.5 and 10 for BIC as they have assigned it and 4 to 13 for DTG. And if it's black, that means it's, it's resistant. So greater than 10 for BIC, greater than 13 for DTG. Um, so these are primary mutations, so there is resistance to um, EVG and or RAL for all of these, um, but both BIC and DTG remain phenotypically sensitive. Uh, looking at some clinical isolates, we've looked at several clinical isolates. Here I'm just pulling in the 140 and 148 combinations that we've looked at. This is where we do have some reduced susceptibility um, to Bictegravir. So we can see... Um, uh, when we're trying to figure out algorithms, there's the genotype-phenotypic um, correlation. And so for 140S, 148H, you can see that many of these are sensitive to both DTG and BIC, but you do have in the middle panel some reduced susceptibility without additional other mutations. Um, we can get resistance. Resistance isn't impossible. So if you move to the right, you can see that when you have 140, 148 plus some other substitutions, you can get some reduced susceptibility. Um, and these other substitutions we've seen are 74M, E138A or K, and T97A. Um, so we're interested in, in understanding more um, activity of BIC in patients with integrase resistance, but we're not quite there yet in the development program. And then um, the four phase three studies that led to approval. Here we have the, the populations, the comparators. Um, the efficacy was non-inferior. I'm not showing you all the numbers here. Jonathan did that very nicely yesterday. Um, but you can see that there was no resistance development to BFTAF. Um, the little things on the right there next to the zero for 1878 show that one patient in a comparator arm had a, had a, a emergent mutation. And then the fifth study here in 1961 is a switch study in women only. Um, and so that has comparators of ECF, TAF, or TDF, and atazanavir boosted with Truvada. And that was also found to be non-inferior with no resistance to BF-TAF. There was one patient um, on Genvoya who had an emergent M184V. So very good um, resistance and efficacy for BF-TAF so far with zero emergent resistance. 
So this, these are integrase inhibitors. So the two naive studies, this is missing excluded data, show high levels of suppression of the virus by week four, which was maintained out to week 48. Okay, so now we can talk about resistance. So at screening in these studies, for the treatment-naive studies, we looked only at protease and reverse transcriptase genotype using the GenoSure MG monogram assay. We didn't do any prospective integrase genotyping. In the switch studies, um, we had historical genotypes collected if they were available, and we hand-tabulated those into our database, and we collected data on protease, RT, and integrase. So then um, what we did once um, everyone was enrolled is that we went back and looked at everyone in the naive studies for protease, RT, and integrase genotypes. Um, this had been pre-agreed on with the FDA. And so we did it, this using a deep sequencing approach, and we used CKIT in Germany. And what I'm showing you here is just... Um, Mutations that were present at greater than or equal to 15%, um, we wanted this, we didn't want to get into um, low frequency resistance mutations. So the mutations that I'll show you here um, are quite frequent. In the switch studies, uh, we collected whole blood at baseline so that we could go back and do um, DNA genotyping <laughs> retrospectively, and we're in the process of doing that now. Um, so here we look at RT, protease, and integrase DNA, DNA genotype, and here we're using the GenoSure archive assay of monogram. If you're not familiar with that, it uses a deep sequencing approach. They implement an ApoBec hypermutation filter, and they report mutations that are generally around above 15%. Okay, so here I have baseline resistance-associated substitutions from the two naive studies. So this is, since we had no emergent resistance, let's see what we found and what we um, could treat. And so then I have the FDA snapshot outcome, which is at week 48 HIV RNA less than 50 copies. So overall in the BF2 combined BF-TAF groups, we have 634 patients. And at week 48, we had a 91% um, suppression of HIV. And then what was really interesting is that we had a few patients with primary integrase resistance mutations. Um, five of those had T97A, which is a known low-frequency polymorphism. Um, and we can debate whether that should be a primary or not. But in these studies, it was pre-specified as a primary. And they were all successes at week 48. And we had a very interesting case of a Q148H plus G140S transmitted resistance mutation. Um, so this is similar to the case presented yesterday by Carlo Perno. Um, and this patient was a success, and I'll show you some more details on that patient. Um, this is the most exciting patient to me as a virologist um, because it's early days with BIC and we don't have um, data in experienced patients failing with integrase mutations. So the protocols um, excluded patients who had resistance to FTC or TAF, but a few patients with primary NRTI resistance did enroll in this study, and these, um, there was one L74V, and um, there were a few patients with TAMs. 14 of these 16s with TAMs was a single TAM, um, and they had high efficacy outcomes. Most of the reasons for that not being 100 is because people um, left the study or were lost to follow up. It was not due to virologic failure. Um, and then I have data on NR NNRTI resistance and PI resistance. Now, BFTAF doesn't have an NNRTI or a PI in it, um, so we expected high efficacy. Um, but nevertheless, we want to, to describe the numbers of patients that had these mutations. So 12% had transmitted NNRTI resistance. Um, most of that consisted of K103, NRS, and substitutions at E138. And they all had high efficacy outcomes and 2.5% had a primary PI resistance mutations, and they did well as also. So we're a patient with transmitted res integrase resistance. Um, so we found this using the deep sequencing approach. We sent those baseline samples to monogram for confirmation analysis, and these are the reports. So um, monogram confirmed using a population sequencing approach, the G140SQ148-8 mutation, and um, this Muta the integrase mutations weren't on their own, so there was also a K70R NRTI resistance mutation and a K103N. So we had resistance to three classes, although they, this patient had a lot of options. And I'm not showing here, they were sensitive to all of the PIs. 
So Monogram also did a phenotypic analysis, and so this isolate had 2.14-fold uh, to BIC, four point, a little over four-fold for DTG, and was fully resistant to EVG and RAL. So this was not surprising. Um, but how did they do? They did very well. So we were happy to see that um, at week four, suppression was achieved, and it's now maintained out to the current time point of week 96. So this is the first case of an ART-naive patient with transmitted integrase resistance um, treated with BF-TAF. Um, and the suppression, as I said, was rapid and maintained. And this, this mutation, or this subject had several mutations. <coughs> Moving into the switch studies. So the data that we have here, combining both of the switch studies, we had 572 BF-TAF treated patients. Um, to date, we have 71% of those patients, or 405, have protease or RT baseline data. About half of the patients had historical data available, and the rest um, so far are from baseline DNA genotyping. Um, with regards to the integrase gene, 23 patients had historical genotypes, and we are filling out the database with the rest of the DNA genotypes. Um, so at this point, what we did was, when we, we started out doing the DNA genotyping, we chose patients who had been on therapy for over 10 years or the date of start of therapy was unknown. Um, and now we're expanding out and, and um, doing the DNA genotyping for every patient in the study who has data or who has a sample available. Um, so these numbers uh, will be adjusted at upcoming conferences. Okay, so what we had here is we had one patient with T97A who um, was successfully maintained suppression at week 48. 52 patients, or 13%, we found have primary NRTI resistance. So this was much higher than we had expected. Five patients had K65R by DNA genotyping and they were successes. 30 patients had a 184V or I, and honestly most of those were Vs because the Is get thrown out with the Apobec hypermutation filter. Um, 28 of the 30 of these were suppressed at week 48, and I have broken down on the bottom those two missing patients. So one discontinued while suppressed at week four, and one had a rebound at week eight, so still had the 184V mutation, but had no detectable BIC in their plasma. So that was the reason for, for the rebound. Um, that physician changed their regimen and they resuppressed. 29, 29 patients had a TAM and high maintained suppression. 73 patients had an NNRTI resistance mutation. Most of these were K103N, and 6% had a primary PI resistance mutation. So that's uh, we're, what we have done retrospectively, although the virus doesn't care if we know what the mutations are there or not when we do, we do the analyses. But um, we've now enrolled a new study, study 4030. And this is a switch study. It's double-blinded. It's um, suppressed adults on DTG, FTDF, or FTAF. And we're switching them to BFTAF or to DTG plus FTAF. Um, this is a very interesting study as a virologist because we're allowing any NRTI, NNRTI, or PI resistance mutations. Um, the criteria for prior suppression is dependent on if you have NRTI resistance mutations or not, so requiring either three months or six months of prior suppression. Um, you can have no documented resistance to an integrase inhibitor, so if you know about it. Um, and you could not have had confirmed virologic failure on an integrase inhibitor, but you could have failed on prior regimens. And of course, HBV and HCV co-infections were allowed because everybody, as, with respect to HBV, um, everybody in the study will be on TAF. So the primary endpoint is approaching um, probably around the end of the year, and we'll see some results from this later on in the year. But this will be really interesting for us to see. So um, conclusions. We have in our treatment naive patients with BF-TAF, uh, highly efficacious, as well as the comparator dolutegravir-based regimens. There was rapid viral load suppression by week four. The pre-existing resistance that we found did not affect efficacy outcomes, and I've highlighted here our one patient, one patient with um, transmitted integrase resistance. In the suppressed studies, where um, BF-TAF was also highly efficacious through week 48, Pre-existing resistance that we found so far has also not affected efficacy outcomes, and I'll highlight the M184V and the 1-2 TAM patients that we've been studying. <laughs>
Um, no patient developed resistance to study drug on BF-TAF or a dolutegravir-based regimen. And uh, we think that all of this information that we're starting to mine out of these studies um, on pre-existing resistance allows us to move into um, further studies of bictegravir or BF-TAF in patients with virologic resistance. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the patients and their families um, that contributed to these studies, the study investigators and site staff. Um, at Gilead Science Spaces, specifically our BF-TAF team led by Aaron Quirk, and in clinical virology, my team, um, as well as Nicola Margot, who did all of the site-directed mutant studies, CKIT, Martin Doimer, and, and Alex Dien, and Tim Persine is our project manager at Monogram. Thank you.